So a few years ago, I was uh, invited to give a talk uh, in Barcelona and only had a couple of days. I was on my way to Vienna. Uh, I had never been to Barcelona before and I um, had very little time to be a tourist there. So I, um, my plan was uh, to go into this space that many of you will recognize. This is uh, Gaudi's La Sagrada Familia. And my plan was I would go there for a couple of hours and then leave and uh, go to see other uh, parts of this beautiful city. It turned out I went as early as I could when it was open for tourists and I ended up spending the entire day there, not leaving until it was time for them to close. And so the question uh, in some ways is why, why would such a structure, why does a built environment potentially have such a transfixing uh, effect on us? Uh, and ultimately that's really the kind of question we would like to pursue. I have been to Aachen a few times uh, for about 10 years. We had a combined training program with Penn and Aachen and the psychiatry uh, group. And I've had a few students from Aachen who have all been very good. Uh, and if we were physically there, uh, I might, if I was physically there, I might be talking about this space uh, as well, uh, which uh, I have uh, been in. Uh, and um, is also an extraordinary space. So it's hard to talk about architecture uh, without invoking uh, Vitruvius. Most of you, uh, I suspect, know and know better than I that he was uh, a Roman architect in the first century BCE, and he wrote a 10 volume treatise in architecture uh, and sometimes uh, this uh, extensive writing is distilled into this kind of Vitruvian triad, which is that he emphasized that with architectural design, there are three components that one uh, might be preoccupied by. The first is the firmitas, uh, almost the materiality of the, the buildings. Uh, the second is its utilitas, its functionality, which is does the building function in the way that it is designed to, how well does it do that? And the third is venustas or the aesthetics of the building. And arguably much of architectural approaches in uh, a good part of the 20th century ended up conflating the functionality and the aesthetics of buildings. So the idea was that uh, that the the beauty of the building is in its functionality, uh, and I think that conflation is starting to get separated um, uh, at this point, where people are more concerned, are starting, I think, to get concerned about the aesthetics of uh, of the built environment uh, in a more explicit and a foregrounded way. So we take this uh, node uh, around aesthetics and this is a general model. Uh, and it's not really, it's maybe a little grandiose to call it a model. It's more of a framework that we have used in, uh, in, in describing and, and thinking about research programs and aesthetic experiences in general, uh, which is that we think that these experiences emerge out of interactions of three large scale systems in the brain. One having to do with our sensory and motor systems. Uh, and that in some ways is, um, is self-evident uh, that our experiences are, uh, are guided by and are uh, influenced by the design of our sensory and motor systems. Similarly, that we have a emotional reaction and affective reaction uh, and impose value on what we're looking at. So there is a connection to emotion and valuation. And the third part of this triad is the way in which knowledge and meaning uh, modulates this link between our sensory motor systems and our valuation systems. 
And it's particularly this knowledge and meaning part where, uh, where the, uh, there's more variability. This is where, depending on the kind of education you have, the background you have, the cultural milieu in which you are living and raised, uh, and even in what point in time, uh, if you were uh, talking about this in the 15th century or the first century, or perhaps uh, 200 years from now, the kind of uh, uh, the, the imposition of these <clears throat> uh, experiences uh, is likely to be much more variable. And that's, I think, where a lot of our, the variability in our responses to the environment comes from. So, the other thing worth pointing out is when we're talking about the built environment, uh, we face a kind of problem. And the problem is that our brains, as we understand it, primarily evolved into its modern state during the Pleistocene. And the Pleistocene is about 2 million years. Uh, you can kind of see where Homo erectus is about 2 million years and, and Homo sapiens uh, you know, probably around uh, 200,000 years. And so this is the time in which our brains evolved into its contemporary form. And we've only been settled in, uh, in uh, built environments of the way that we are used to uh, for maybe the last eight or 10,000 years. And so in some ways our brains are a child of the past uh, and yet we are living in the present. And for most of us, uh, the environments in which we uh, spend 90% of our time or more uh, is structured by right angles. Uh, there are no right angles in nature, right? So this is something that we have to contend with is what is the relationship uh, between the built environment, uh, which in some ways is not really well-designed intrinsically designed for the way that our brains evolved. So generally people will, um, when you think about uh, thinking about the experience of the built environment, uh, broadly, there are two ways of thinking about it, which is what are the features of the environment? And in that uh, one dominant view, I think, uh, or a view that gets a lot of attention is this notion of biophilic design. And maybe this is a way to try to address this evolutionary problem that I mentioned. And the question is, what is our relationship to nature and the built environment? Uh, is it explicitly nature? Or is there something that we can abstract away from nature that might be, uh, might be beneficial for our relationship to this environment? And then the second way, which uh, we have uh, focused on, uh, and this uh, particularly by virtue of being a cognitive neuroscientist, is what are the properties of our brain uh, that, uh, that uh, react to our built environment? Uh, and how can we then uh, connect uh, these two parts, which is the features of the environment and the features of our brain uh, as they are mediated through the built environment? So that's the general strategy. And, and ultimately the hope is that we can abstract something away from both the built and natural environment uh, that uh, provides some guiding principles. So that's the story I'm going to try to tell you. Now this particular line of research began about uh, 10 years ago. And this was a, um, this was a uh, collaboration, an international collaboration uh, the lead author, Ocean Vartanian, is in Canada. Uh, these images were picked by, uh, by uh, architects in Denmark. The data itself was collected in, uh, in Spain, in Tenerife. Uh, and so I think in this kind of work, we do find ourselves uh, working across many different labs and, and different people. So, this was a, a set of stimuli, 200 images that were curated by these architects and they varied by these kinds of dimensions. 
All right, so I'm going to continue. Uh, so anyway, these were images that were curated by architects, and they were uh, on these dimensions, which is that uh, either the ceilings were high or low, that the interiors were rectilinear or curvilinear, uh, and the spaces were either open or closed. And in this case, what we meant by open is you can see past the enclosure, uh, as opposed to a space in which uh, the, the boundaries of the enclosure uh, is the extent uh, of, uh, of your vision. And in this first study, we were asking a very, very simple question, uh, which is that in our response to the aesthetics of these images of, the, of built interiors, are we engaging the same structures of the brain? So we were asking uh, a very simple question, which is that, is it the case that our brain response uh, has the same reward response, the same pleasure response uh, to the built environment as it does to very core, uh, to very core uh, appetitive uh, pleasures uh, like food and sex and so on. And so the answer to that was fairly straightforward, uh, which is yes. Uh, and what is being shown here is a sagittal section of the brain. And there's this neural activity within parts uh, deep in the medial portion of the brain in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. That is an area that is, uh, is typically uh, activated under conditions in general of pleasure. It's a very simple question, uh, which is that uh, it looks like our response to the built environment is, uh, is similar uh, to uh, the kind of pleasure we get from that, at least the neural signature of that is very similar to what we get from uh, more basic, uh, basic uh, pleasures. So that was something we had done. Uh, and then later, uh, a, a couple of years later, I had a student uh, Alex Coburn, who was a, uh, uh, a graduate student in architecture at Cambridge, and he wanted to do some of his empirical work in my lab. So we went back and looked through the literature of the kinds of questions, what are the psychological dimensions that people generally ask uh, participants uh, about their responses to, uh, and this is for either the built environment or the natural environment. And we came up with what we thought were 16 psychological dimensions that, uh, that are frequently asked in this kind of research. So, so then what we did is we took these same 200 images and uh, this was an online study initially, where we asked about 800 participants uh, to rate each of these images on these 16 dimensions. And if you do that, you can get this kind of correlation matrix where you see how similar or distinct uh, people as a group are in responding uh, to these kinds of uh, interiors using these psychological dimensions. Once you have this kind of correlation matrix, there are a few uh, data reduction techniques uh, that we used. Uh, and one is called uh, semantic network analysis. So Yoed Kennett, uh, who is listed on there, is now on faculty at Technion in Israel, uh, did the network analysis. Uh, and this is what we find. So this is a way in which you can uh, lay out spatially the relationship of these psychological dimensions. And uh, there are quantitative ways in which one can, uh, one can decide how these networks break out into communities. And in this case, we thought that there were three fundamental communities uh, that these responses clustered in. And so what we're calling them are coherence, which is how organized and, uh, and legible, how coherent is a space. Uh, a second one is fascination. Uh, how much does one feel interested uh, and wish to uh, investigate, to explore that space? 
And the third is what we're calling hominess, which is that do people feel relaxed? Do they feel comfortable in this space? Uh, and I think we've all probably had the experience of how these can dissociate from each other. I certainly have been in hotel rooms where they're very coherent and they might be well appointed uh, without necessarily feeling homey. So it appears that this, uh, these three uh, factors, uh, at least as determined by the semantic network analysis, seem to be critical in response to interior, uh, interior uh, design. We then did a more uh, conventional uh, kind of statistical analysis, uh, principal component analysis, and essentially find the same thing. Uh, and here you can see that across these three dimensions, uh, these three components, that 90% of the variance of how people are responding is accounted for. So it really does seem to capture much of our uh, general response to these kinds of interiors. So we replicated this again in another, a new group of uh, participants and essentially found the same thing. And then the final thing we did was we went back to the original study, which I showed you uh, that was uh, published in 2013, uh, because in that study, people had looked at exactly the same images and we reanalyzed we reanalyze those data now using these components uh, where we could model the data uh, using these components. And it was an exploratory study in the sense that where the question was, is there a neural signature to this kind of psychological response that now we had shown in two different uh, groups of participants? And sure enough, what we find is that there was, uh, that within our occipital cortex, that there were different neural signatures to coherence, hominess, uh, and fascination. Now, what's important about this is in some ways, you can think of this as being the, uh, as close to a double blind study as you can have uh, as an experimentalist. And the reason I say that is that these data were collected when we had not yet identified these dimensions or components. The participants who were in the scanner uh, had no idea that these were relevant because we didn't know they were relevant. And yet when we go back and reanalyze this data, their, the, their brains at the time were actually responding to these dimensions. And one broader implication of this is that we are probably, our brains are probably always responding uh, to the built environment in ways that we don't, uh, are not explicitly aware of. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the extent to which this response guides our behavior uh, remains, a, remains a big question. So, the next thing uh, we thought was, we have these three components. We think they're important psychologically. We think they have a neural signature. Uh, and so there's a question of uh, how does this generalize? And uh, does this, how does this apply uh, to different populations? So this is a study that was recently published. Uh, it was with fewer participants. So it doesn't have the same kind of power as the earlier study. Uh, uh, does. Uh, but we asked the question of, uh, do people who are on the, um, on the autistic spectrum and people who are design students, so they're formally being trained in design, is their response uh, to these kinds of images along these three dimensions similar to what, uh, what people in general, neurotypicals, uh, uh, are responsive to. And so what we find is the following, which is uh, first talking about design students. So design students are especially sensitive to coherence, uh, more so than the other, um, more so than the other components. Uh, and we think this is probably, uh, there is something about coherence that 
we suspect is more analytic, it's more cognitive and less uh, in terms of an affective or an emotional response. Uh, and so it is probably the case that design students who are in this process of really being analytic and learning their trade are much more focused on those aspects of, uh, of design. And hopefully as they, uh, as such students incorporate notions, uh, as this becomes more internalized, that they will again be more sensitive to some of the emotional uh, features of uh, how we respond to these environments. When it comes to uh, people on the, on the autistic uh, spectrum, we found that they were much more responsive to coherence and hominess. Uh, and this also makes a certain amount of sense, I think, which is that uh, both being comfortable in their space and having the space being organized is probably important. Uh, as a speculation, it may be that fascination which often is, is quite uh, closely correlated with complexity, uh, perhaps for people with, uh, uh, with autism, this may, uh, this may be over the top in a way that the, the, the stimulation might be overwhelming for them. That's purely a speculation. But the general point here is that it, when we think about these three components, that they may vary in their weighting when it comes to different kinds of uh, populations. And let's see. So the next, uh, and this, this is the last study I'm going to talk about, uh, again, in this question of how well do these uh, generalize. Uh, our initial set of stimuli were all highly curated, uh, picked by architects. And we wanted to ask the question of, do these components generalize? Do they generalize to, uh, to, the, to buildings, uh, to the exterior uh, aspects of buildings? Uh, and how do they generalize to natural landscapes? And if, it's, if they were images that were not specifically selected uh, by architects. So we took a set of stimuli and there's a, a researcher who right now is in Frankfurt, uh, a guy named Ed Vessel, who's at the Max Planck Institute there, uh, who uh, had used these stimuli in, uh, in an aesthetic study. And so we just borrowed his stimuli. So we didn't have a hand in picking this uh, in a way that would be uh, perhaps uh, implicitly guided by our, our notions of these three dimensions. So we took these, uh, these images uh, and subjected them uh, to a similar kind of study. And this, I think we had close to somewhere between 250 and 300 participants looking at this. So what did we find? First thing, uh, and this is basically a replication of what Ed had found and what is tends to be true in neuroesthetic studies in general which is if you ask preferences, people tend to be more consistent for natural kinds, that's faces and natural landscapes, and less consistent for human artifacts, uh, which is in this case tends to be either, uh, either artwork or architecture itself. And so that's essentially what we find. This is using a mean minus one, um, technique, which is not worth going into, but basically we replicate this idea that people uh, are more consistent with each other in their preferences for natural landscapes than they are for exterior architecture. But the real question is how do these three dimensions, uh, how do they play out uh, in these uh, two kinds of, uh, set of sets of images? So what we find here is showing it with exterior architecture is that again, we do replicate this idea of these three dimensions of hominess, coherence, and fascination. What's interesting uh, is that here you can see that the coherence dimension is a little bit removed from the other two. Uh, and this 
again, is at least consistent with the observation with the design students that there might be something a bit different going on when people are responding to coherence. And our intuition is that this is more cognitive than affective, uh, which is why it's a little bit uh, removed, especially when we're dealing with exterior architecture. When we come to natural landscapes, what we find is that uh, these dimensions of uh, hominess uh, and coherence are actually conf are conflated. They get combined with fascination uh, being a bit removed. And for those of you who uh, are aware of the kinds of writings that the Kaplans uh, wrote uh, 30, 40 years ago, I think this is probably consistent with some of their ideas of how people respond to natural landscapes, uh, which uh, uh, the ideas that are common are prospect and refuge. So prospect meaning you have a good view and you feel uh, safe. And we suspect that prospect and refuge uh, probably have something uh, to do with uh, hominess, the sense of, <clears throat> excuse me, the sense of safety. Uh, and fascination, they also um, introduced this notion of mystery, that landscapes that have a bit of a mystery uh, might have uh, uh, also has a kind of appeal. And we think that our dimension of fascination might be related to what uh, they had referred to as fascination. Now, there's one interesting observation uh, in these data that I'm going to uh, highlight, which is the sense of hominess for exterior architecture, uh, one of the nodes in that is the notion that it be natural, right? So there is a sense of which, <clears throat> uh, and this is something architects have uh, been, uh, and designers have uh, been quite sensitive to, is that we like nature in the context of our architecture. But it probably doesn't make sense to have a completely romanticized version of nature. Nature can be scary. Uh, I personally have had the experience of backpacking in the Canadian Rockies and having to be airlifted out because there was a grizzly in the, in the area. So it's not a given that nature inherently uh, is a comfortable space. Uh, and what we see in natural landscapes is that a certain amount of order uh, is uh, contributes to people's feeling of hominess. So you have this uh, interesting contrast where the more nature in the built environment, people tend to feel comfortable and the more order you have in natural environments, people tend to feel comfortable. And then we did some additional analyses. Uh, and here the question, uh, it was sort of a secondary question, but the question was, are there underlying patterns that matter to people regardless of the kind of architecture or the kind of landscapes, right? So it could be that, you know, if you like beaches, then all of your preferences are gonna be loaded on to beaches regardless of these, uh, these other dimensions. Uh, similarly, you might um, really like modern buildings and then uh, all of these other, uh, that, that preference for modern over classical buildings uh, maybe overwhelms uh, your responses. Uh, and so the point of this is to just point out that complexity and naturalness seem to really apply across the board. Uh, that those may be more, more fundamental uh, dimensions that are independent of the content of what we're looking at uh, that, uh, that uh, have, has an influence in how we respond. Okay, so I'm going to step back from the data and just make a few observations. There has been, I think, an interest in the this uh, relationship between architecture and neuroscience. And here are some uh, examples of books. Uh, Built Beautiful is a, it was just, came out last year. It's a documentary uh, that was uh, made by Don Ruggles, who's an architect in Colorado, who was very uh, 
has been very interested in how neuroscience relates to architecture. But the thing to point out is the relationship, unfortunately, is somewhat asymmetric, which is that mostly, mostly it's architects writing about neuroscience, and there has been relatively little uh, conversation from the neuroscience end uh, to, to architecture. And one feature of this is that uh, what you end up with is something in aesthetics that I've talked about, a difference between descriptive neuroaesthetics and experimental neuroaesthetics. So descriptive neuroaesthetics, and I would say the same applies to architecture, descriptive architecture is where we take properties of the brain that we know are gen is generally accepted among, uh, among neuroscientists and then map that on to concerns that architects might have. Right? Perfectly reasonable way of approaching this. Uh, and uh, this uh, allows us to kind of map the space between neuroscience and architecture. I think what it doesn't do uh, is do actual experiments. And so what we have suggested is there's a difference between neuroscience and architecture to neuroscience of architecture. And I think for any programmatic line of research that as an experimentalist, I think we have to be doing experiments and it's, just, it's not sufficient just to have a kind of descriptive mapping of neuroscience onto architecture. So here are some challenges, and this, this will be obvious to many of you, which is that uh, everything I presented to you are data that are collected from, uh, are data that are collected from two-dimensional flat images. And this, for people, especially the imaging experiments where people are lying flat on their back, on first principles, you would think that this is not a particularly good way to be studying architecture, which is about being embedded in a space uh, that is three dimensions through which you navigate. Uh, and so having someone look at flat images in either a laboratory or in a scanner uh, is probably not the most ecologically valid way uh, to go about this. So where, can, where might we go? Uh, there are certainly uh, people who are working on these kinds of uh, techniques. So the question is, do you bring the outside, the wild into the laboratory, or do you take the laboratory out into the wild? And as far as bringing the outside in, probably virtual reality is uh, the most in the near future, the most likely way that one might start to, to at least introduce a third dimension. Uh, it doesn't capture all of the other sensations that one might have in a space. Uh, and as far as collecting neural data out in the field, there, there are basically two ways of doing this, which is using mobile EEG, uh, and the other is uh, near infrared spectroscopy. And there are some technical issues with this uh, that have to be resolved. I'm reasonably confident that uh, architects, uh, I'm sorry, that engineers will be able to sort uh, this, these technical issues out. But once the technical issues are solved, which is, uh, which is being able to, uh, which is being able to separate out signal from noise, there's still a conceptual question is that once you have all of this uh, neural data that's coming in, what's the useful question in what context uh, would, uh, would you then run these kinds of studies? But I suspect in the next five years, we will have more and more information about, um, uh, about this and about collecting uh, this sort of neural data in the wild. And then, the other thing that seems to be on the horizon, and as a, as a design group, you guys might know more about this than I, but there is a, a movement towards quantified buildings where that our, uh, our buildings themselves are embedded with sensors that might be able to collect more information of actual behavior in those spaces. Uh, and again, we'd have the same issue that I just mentioned, which is just having a lot of data by itself is not all that meaningful. 
it is still incumbent on people who are collecting these data to have very clear, conceptually clear uh, and well-identified questions uh, to which these uh, data would be put to use. So I'm gonna end with uh, sort of my big uh, take home points, which is that we think these three dimensions, coherence, fascination, and hominess are important in the experience of people in these, uh, in these environments. It is worth asking, uh, and this is particularly thinking about the, uh, about the people with autism, but we're just scratching the surface here, which is who, what kind of people, so if you were designing a, uh, uh, a, uh, a residential facility for people with short-term memory problems, for example. Like, how do these play out? What, who and what is the space designed for? Uh, in a, you know, your, the concerns in a museum might be very different than in a library, might be very different than a school. Uh, and so again, how these three components are weighted may turn out to be quite different. Uh, I think this, Observation about nature and order uh, are worth paying attention to the way in which we prefer nature in our built environment and order in our uh, order in our natural environment uh, is is worth paying attention to. And then the last thing, and, and this is almost a, a plea uh, to designers and architects. And what I'm uh, showing here is one way in which most neuroscientists now think about how we, uh, we um, get information about an, our environment. And so the general notion is that we sample information through our sens sensory uh, systems. We sample uh, from the environment. From that, we simulate what we think is going on and we're making a prediction and then when we sample again, that prediction either is accurate or it's not. <clears throat> and if it's not accurate, there's a prediction error. And from that error, we adapt to uh, recreating a new simulation, a new prediction, a new hypothesis of what is in the environment. And I would suggest that this as a model might be useful and perhaps it's not done very much, which is architects and designers in some ways are predicting the future, right? What people are doing is predicting what the experience of people in that environment is going to be. And very good architects and designers probably have exquisite predictions and are very good at this. But what isn't happening to my knowledge is after a building is designed or a space is designed, where people continue then to collect data from users in that space to find out if the predictions that architects make actually obtain in the experience of people in those spaces. Uh, and I think that's something that would be extremely useful uh, to be able to then adapt those principles uh, going forward uh, and uh, continuing to learn from from the from the buildings uh, and the interiors that have been designed.